Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Good evening to you, Corinne. Okay, just scanning to see if we know everybody here already. Yeah, I guess we've scanned away most of the new people. Uh, we continue in our exploration of the ninth chapter of, of Masechet Brachot, the Tractate of Brachot, in the Babylonian Talmud. And we're on the topic of blessings. That's what all this chapter is about. We're on the topic of miracles. We had a break uh, from the personal miracles that were brought up both in the Mishnah and in the Gemara afterwards, the Mishnah being the earlier section of literature from the first few centuries of the Common Era, the Gemara, the, uh, surround, the discussions surrounding it. Uh, the rabbis of the Mishnah are known as Tanaim. The rabbis of the Gemara are known as Amoraim. No need to really remember all that, but I'll keep reminding, I'll keep bringing it up. Well, if we want to try to track the chronology of what we're reading, it's not in chronological order at all, not at all. Uh, while the Mishnah comes at the beginning of at, at every chapter and at various stages in the chapter, and that is early material, first of all, in the Mishnah itself, there are rabbis that, that are, for, are from over 200 plus years, as if they're in discussion with each other. And when it comes to the Gemara, uh, sometimes it is rabbis, Amoraim, later rabbis, but sometimes they're quoting earlier material from the time of the Mishnah. And uh, one quote might be from a rabbi in the third end of the third century, another one might be a rabbi from the fourth or even the fifth century. So um, we're not going to go down to that level to really make those maps that some people do to try to figure out any given set. We're more trying to get an idea for what's in this what might be relevant. What was interesting, I think, to for many last week was the idea that when you get to a geologically um, interesting place in the map, on the, from a geographical point of view, when you arrive someplace, which is out of the ordinary, interesting, then uh, either you create a story around it, or you say, oh yeah, that's where this happened. Sasha and I happen to be up in Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe Nevada today, and and we read in many of the places we stop, the nature spots, we see the legends, the Native American legends of how, for instance, a particular lake was <laughs> by casting leaves down against the evil spirit and that brought water and the water washes away the evil spirit. And that created one of the very large lakes, not Lake Tahoe. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to see it everywhere. And my conversation with Dan, who can't be here today, but he's been following um, uh, the, the recordings, um, the big stone that I spoke about near uh, Joshua Tree, Yucca Tree, is, 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 is indeed in Landers. And, um, and uh, I don't, we, he didn't know, and I haven't seen any Native American oral traditions about it. I would love to find out. But uh, the people that, that almost worship that rock are the UFO guys. That's a lot of UFO people gather in that area, and they've got some things to say about it. Um, and, uh, I guess that's it. That was apropos Og's great stone. Just to show that our text, for those that study in different sections that we're doing, different opportunities during the week, that our texts are constantly intertextualitizing. Uh, yeah, I know I just made up the word. Um, it, the, the verse that we ended with Torah teachings yesterday, was another reminder that the Israelites had defeated Sihon and Og, Og, Melech HaBashan, Melech Og, the king of Bashan. So when you read the Torah on a regular basis, as Jews have done, whether it was a three and a half year cycle in the land of Israel, whether it was an annual cycle in Babylonia, the way we do today, these things are constantly in your mind. So when you look around someplace, that is, I see my internet uh, connection is not stable. So I, when I see that, I'll pause. Hopefully there won't be too much break. Um, when you everywhere you look, you find that kind of meaning. All the more so if it's in a place where historically those things are supposed to have happened. Anybody who is anybody who is who, who as a youngster grew up in in Israel, uh, they don't think they do it so much anymore. But still, when I was in high school in Israel, we did it, and I think even after that, our girls maybe to a certain extent. When you go out on a hike in Israel or a, a two, three day camping trip, you have your Tanakh with you, you have your Hebrew Bible with you. You're constantly opening up to read 
the narrative of, of thousands of years ago of, of what purported at least to happen in that space. Um, Christian pilgrims, of course, do that also all the time in both in the in the Hebrew Bible literature, but but in, in particular in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and around the Sea of Galilee uh, with their New Testaments. But I forget to bring up Luke today. Mark, or, um, hold on, I made a note, just a second. Um, if I forget to bring up Mark, the Gospel according to Mark, uh, apropos something, please remind me, uh, sister, that'll be your, your uh, obligation. Another way of these, how these things are interconnected for all those of us in Or Hamidbar who are constantly studying together, at the same time, in no way do I mean to uh, to exclude people who are not. I think there's something in this for everybody. At least I'm trying to make it that way. Okay, today's sheet is in the chat is in the chat box. Uh, if you don't have it, uh, we welcome um, Adina. I'm not sure we've met you today. If we have, I apologize. So Adina, it's good to have you with us. We're studying Talmud, and um, we're on the topic of miracles. We're the topic of a, a topic of blessings. We've done public things national, ethnic, uh, you know, uh, miracles. That was last week, more or less, when you're in such, such a place. And now we go from the geographical to more the experiential. Geography is going to be connected to this, but it's more in a person's life. And that's what we have here in this tradition, according to Rav Yehuda, who quotes Rav. Okay. Uh, Jackie, would you like to read today? Sure. <clears throat> Rav Yehuda said, that Rav said, four must give thanks, seafarers, those who walk in the desert, and one who was ill and recovered, and one who was incarcerated in prison and went out. Okay, so giving thanks here is not just thank you, thank you, Warden, for how hosting me, thank you, Captain, for bringing me across the shores of, the, uh, or from one shore to the other of Lake Tahoe, no, no, this is people who are considered to be in dangerous positions. And the thanks that they give are, um, are it's understood here, tzichin lahadot, that la kadosh baruch hu, that the thanks are given, the praise is given to God. Do you have the text? You have it? Okay. Um, okay, so four things, seafarers, right? It's not a word that we use often living in the Coachella Valley in the desert. We are constantly con uh, uh, walking across the desert, although, uh, uh, except for Richard, who likes to walk around in the middle of the night in the desert by on, his, on his own, most of us don't walk around. Richard, you doing all right? I know you were in the mountains for a while, high altitude. Did uh, you still have a sense of humor? You're muted, Richard. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like a little dizzy. That's it. You did, you're jet lagged from your from yeah. schlepping from Colorado to California. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have a one hour jet lag. All right. Well, Sid is happy to see you because he was the butt of my jokes yesterday. Mm -hmm. I told him he, he's the sit in for you, right? Oh, yes, but, no. well, he's a he's sit in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Stand in, stand in, sit in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, four different kinds of things. Does this bring up anything that anybody knows in Judaism until now, or in Christianity for that matter, if that's your tradition? Malka, does this ring any bells? I, I think I think it's like giving thanks for what when you're in a bad situation and you get out of it. You know, you give thanks to the Lord for for getting me out of it. Right. And how is that done though? When you were growing up in 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 the Orthodox world, said how was that done? Do you remember? Yeah, you you made a, a bracha. Uh, I can't exactly say what it was, but as, as soon as you tell me, I'll, I'll remember. Would it be Shekhyanu? No, not Shekhyanu is more of no, a happy a occasion. Yeah, that's a happy, but is, right. wouldn't that be a happy occasion to get out of these things? Yeah, is it, it would. And there is something about, thank God I'm alive, Shekhyanu. But we have mm -hmm. a special blessing called Hagomel. A goimel. Oh, right. A go yeah, yeah, right. A go to, bench, to bench goimel. That's what you would remember, Sid. Bench, bench goimel. goimel. All right, so benching for those that don't come from Ashkenazic backgrounds, to bench is to give a blessing in Yiddish. And mm -hmm. benching is blessing. So the most famous benching is mm -hmm. the grace after meals because it's a long one and very often right. it's together. So benching, los mir benching, shall we, shall we say the, the, that that's one of the introductions when three people are sitting together, at least three. Um, but we... Um, uh, 
You mean uh, Gomel Hasidim Tovim? Yeah. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we're going to go now to the. To, there are going to be times where I'm going to map out the the halacha lemaase the things, but that's exactly it, Malka. That's the the blessing for those that have ever been in a synagogue or in yourself. Uh, the typical things that you uh, see it for are people who have been in car accidents, um, uh, survived terrorist attacks. There's people, look at all the years we lived in Israel and Jerusalem. Uh, you're on a bus line and then um, five minutes later, the same bus line in the same place where you were, the bomb goes off. So that's the, those are the kind of things that people would say, Al Gomel, you're coming back from uh, a, um, a dangerous operation in the army, we would do it. There are those that would, uh, a woman after giving birth, we'll say Al Gomel, that's very much folded into the the breed ceremony the the uh the covenant of of the mila the circumcision ceremony that's folded into it in a traditional way uh, even the ceremony that i do that has seven blessings one of those blessings if if the woman is interested that becomes birkata gomel because it's a life-threatening situation um it used to be after you flew it could be still in the orthodox world they're doing that when we were younger if you flew and you landed like, you know, a, a, a transcontinental, then you would say Hagomel. Uh, there's many people that used to say it after driving a certain amount and depended whether you're, you were going according to the authority of Ashkenazic or Sephardic uh, poskim, uh, religion, um, uh, rabbinic um, uh, decisors or uh, authorities. So interesting stuff, but that's what Hagomel is. Hagomel, that blessing literally means thank you, God, for... Um, uh, for for gifting me, gifting me the safety. Something somebody was about to say something. Sorry, I was just going to ask: Is it also tradition for some of these brachas for giving sadaka along with it? So so th th that's a good question. Is it the Talmud here is only talking about um, giving the blessing? But what Jackie's bringing up is something that people do: is to give a gift, a charitable gift, when something has happened. Now that that's a whole area and. I don't remember if we're going to cover that, but I would love to cover that at one time. Um, I've I've always found it um, a, a little distasteful. I'll say a little distasteful because it feels like my relationship with God is not on the level of of having to bribe. And I know the bribe doesn't go to God. And I know the 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 experience the uh, the history of of making offering sacrifices, which could also be understood as a bribe. But um, and, and I see I understand the point. You're you're very thankful. To me, it's fine. It kind of like says, well, what if you? Some people will give the gift beforehand. Some people will give a gift going in and out of a cemetery because there is a sign in traditional cemeteries that say "Sadaka Tatsil Mi Mavid." Charity, uh, char Sadaka is not exactly charity. Many of you know, um, charity is is a, is the Christian idea of giving something of yourself through your heart, through love to another. Sadaka literally means. Um, leveling the playing field, justice. You give this money to this poor person because they deserve it, because everybody deserves a fairer share. It's it's almost a, a, a proto-socialist uh, kind of a thing. But um, but the, the signs that are that are hundreds of years old, this this custom of giving staka uh, it and putting in a in a in a collection box in on your way in, a way out of the cemetery. Also has to. That's bribery, you know. Let let the angel of death not get me today. Look at I'll, I'm willing to pay a few bucks for that, you know. I'm I'm being a little facetious. I understand. Yeah. Um, so Jackie, uh, uh, phenomenal phenomenologically, they are connected. They've been connected, but the Talmud here is really only talking about. Um, if I paraphrase, God doesn't need you to do other things right now. God needs you to be thankful. You were you were in danger. Give thanks for that. Which might, you know, that that might be common to all cultures around the world. But here we're told in Talmudic fashion, there's four categories of people that must do it. So if you tripped and fell, right, and uh, you know you hurt your leg badly, <laughs> you know, and and you got better, I guess you could, but you wouldn't say a gomel. It's when you're in life-threatening situations. That's why there's this argument over driving. It used to be that what if it was a certain amount of distance that you would travel. A, a certain amount of miles, no matter what, in the ancient times, it would be dangerous because there would be animals and bandits and things like that. But once you're in a car, is that as dangerous? Some people might say, yes, in Israel, it actually is more dangerous than, than ancient times, yeah? Um, or in New York City, uh, okay, or in Bali, all right. So, um, 
So, so we got these, these four categories. Now, some of you may have noticed that in a different color, I asked Madalena to put, um, to put on the announcement that the announcement usually goes out on Wednesday. I think it did. So if you're looking for that text, oh, people, if you're signed up, if you're not signed up, then the announcement doesn't reach you. That's, this is only with this class, we do the sign up thing. Uh, there was an announcement to say, if you can, to look at Psalm 107. I, do, mm -hmm. I don't suppose that, did anybody do that? I yes, did. I did. Okay, all right. So, yeah. so uh, Stephen, you want what? How would you characterize Psalm one hundred seven? Is it a psalm you've known before? Did you, anything familiar? What, what's your impression? I not. I was not familiar with it at all. I thought it was um, certainly interesting how it went. Kind of, you know, po like a lot of um, the psalms, they go positive and then negative, and back and forth. It was like a dialogue between you know the the people that were doing bad things and we're suffering and then the people that were doing good things and we're rewarded the mm -hmm. kind of got that out of it so okay um yeah. anybody else it's, i it's think it was very a, okay it's a song of a psalm of thanksgiving from the beginning from the very beginning mm -hmm. that god is talking about being thankful for everything that he's done starting with the wanderers Mm -hmm. So, so it has a historical aspect to it, right? Yes, but it to also me, has a, yeah, it also has a personal aspect to it, mm -hmm. right? So, this is part of the psalm tradition of psalms. You know, psalms could be many things. They could be absolutely personal. They could be national. They could be war psalms, military psalms, the king royal psalms. They can be psalms of destitution, of of, of depression, almost, um, and psalms of utter joy, of music. There's all different kinds of psalms, and this is one that belongs to the group of historical psalms. It reminds me of like it almost could be part of the Deuteronomistic history mm -hmm. because it sounds very much like it. I did this, but you all didn't listen and you did what you wanted to do. So now I zapped you and then you repented and then I did this for you. It sounds like it was the same historians who wrote the Deuteronomistic history that wrote Psalm 107. Well put. Me, so but Right. What Malka is referring to Deuteronomistic history is that of Sefer Dvarim, the fifth book of the Torah, has a right. slightly different theology in the way of telling the story than the previous books and is similar to the way of the, the editing of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And we saw that a lot when we studied the book of jo uh, Judges to the, to, together, where we saw older stories that were enveloped in a literary framework that brought it into the reward and punishment kind of thing. Absolutely great. All these are really good points. Um, some of you know, so I'm guessing nobody went to the Hebrew. If you had gone to the Hebrew, you would, you would have did. seen the words. Yeah, what, what's the words that stood out which were familiar there for you? You mean, I knew was all the words. Phrase? Was any phrase familiar from the Hebrew? Ki Mm-hmm. Ki hasto, right? Right. Ki lelam hasto. Ki lelam hasto. Right. Right. Hodu la donai ki to. Ki lelam. The most ki lelam hasto. We um ki lelam hasto. Something, three dots, because God's chesed, loving kindness, undeserved mm -hmm. blessings. However, we're going to retranslate chesed, a difficult word to translate is forever, is eternal. So even, even if you weren't behaving properly, you still get it, right? Even though you, you fall down. So that, and that's the part. Now, I asked you to look at this song. A fascinating study would be if we were to, I'm often doing this, if you don't know me well yet, for those who are new, I'm often kind of making a mental note to myself, maybe one day we'll do just a full session about this. Yesterday, it was comparing uh, our chapter in, in, in Deuteronomy to the chapter in Nehemiah, I think it was Nehemiah um, mm. uh, chapter 9, to see how the, see the inner biblical um, uh, midrash at work, the inner biblical commentary. Here, I would take this, this chapter, break it down, and then see how it applies to this Talmud in general. Um, and now comes the gospel according to Mark. I didn't have time to look it up. I, the reference I saw when I was preparing, we're on the road now, is actually to a commentary by Kirkpatrick and I have that commentary on Psalms, and he connects this Psalm um, 107 to, I think it's Mark 4, 
but again, I'm not I'm not well versed in the gospel according to Mark, but uh, claims to see that 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 in itself is the way of telling the story of Jesus. There is kind of in many ways playing out this midrash here. Okay, uh, for those again who are new, um, we are we're, we are not messianic uh, Jews. That there's nothing wrong with those that want to be messianic. We're very Jewish Jews. Um, and uh, we're not very, we're not typically very Jewish Jews. We're very liberal, and we're very open-minded. And one of the things we do in Oromi Bar is we have interface study, and so some of you are in that as well. And that's why I bring up, uh, uh, and, and uh, yeah, and we have and we have members in this group today who are not all Jewish as well. So I want I want this to be, but let's get back to the Talmud, okay? We've gone enough. All this kind of is in the outside, and what we're going to see is uh, Psalm 107 is the proof text for our section today, for all of what we're going to learn today. So if we really, if I really want, if we were really studying methodology and how to learn Talmud, I would say everybody should have on their left-hand side the Psalm, I'm not saying to do that now, Psalm 107 open, and especially Hebrew, so we can match the Hebrew to see what, mm -hmm. what kind of play on words and things like that there might be, and the Talmudic text on the right. But for now, though, let's just do the Talmudic text. And um, you know, Rita Claire, you want to read today? Okay, then. So, Eileen, if you would, could you read for us number two? I st I gave numbers this time. I, the numbers are not intrinsic to the Talmudic text. They're the way that I broke it down, just so it'd be easier to find. No, we're st I'm still not hearing you. Okay. All right, then, Madalina, uh, uh, section two. From where do we know about seafarers? As it is written, they who go down to the sea in ships, who do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord. And it says, for he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. Um, and it says, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at the wit's end. And it says, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distress. Uh, do I need, do I read that part? The, the... Yeah. Okay, anyway. Yeah, and it please. says, he makes the storm calm so the waves thereof are still. And it says, then are they glad because they be quiet. So he brings them unto the desired ha heaven. And it says, they are grateful to God for his loving kindness and his wonders for mankind. Okay. So um, it's kind of overkill, right? Mm -hmm. Give me one verse. I get it. Why do I need so many verses? Which leads me to believe that maybe this is a snapshot. Uh, total speculation here. But, well, not maybe not total speculation, but speculation that this, this, this might be a snapshot of a, a lesson that is one of the sages is giving um, on on the book of, of Psalms uh, on that chapter from Psalms um, because he's got it, it 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 reminds me we don't do it this way but in, in the evangelical world I see um, you don't see it really in the Orthodox world so much I'm trying to think in the Hasidic world a little bit more there's more peppering of verses in between things that the Rebbe will say. But in the evangelical world, often you'll say, you know, the, that constant quoting of quote, of qu text after text after text from different parts of, of both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, here, it's all on one theme. Uh, Sasha and I were very lucky. Some of you know, we're up in, in Lake Tahoe on kind of vacation, but didn't want to stop the study. And um, we had a little cruise yesterday. We had a lovely, lovely cruise, but there was nothing dangerous about it. The, the the lake is is rather placid. It's very beautiful, even even a little choppy at times, but nothing. You know, the boat doesn't go up and down. Um, there was nothing dangerous about it. But everybody knows, right? Um, you go into the sea, certainly the large oceans of the world. But here, are the seas that they're talking about, if it's the earlier traditions, is talking about the Mediterranean. I don't think they had experiences with the other seas, right? Um, I don't think that they went. I don't know, but I don't think they went into the Persian Gulf and came around that side to, to where they were living. I'm pretty sure it was all by land. 
and uh, but so the sea they're talking about is Mediterranean Sea, which is it's a sea, it's not an ocean, right? Um, you uh, you don't see uh, what growing up in, Ca in California, Pacific Ocean, you could see six foot, seven foot waves from time to time, right? Certainly a storm. Yeah, waves they're not they're not so big. There are surfers in, in off of Tel Aviv and off the uh, the the west coast of, of of Israel, but it's not the same. Yet when you went out into the ocean, though, then it was dangerous. And remember, the ships were different. Uh, we don't have stories from, I can't think of a story from the Hebrew Bible that has seafaring people other than, of course, what would be the story, quintessential story? Jonah. Exactly, right. And Jonah, and, and, and it's kind of the, 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 the exception that proves the rule. Um, Jonah, and that is exactly a story of what happens, right? There, of course, it's shown in that caricature almost that God is creating that situation just because to punish Jonah, to get Jonah to... to Getting Jonah, getting Jonah to do this, which Jonah didn't do. Jonah went to sleep, right? He went down to the bottom, went to sleep. Everybody else was praying to their gods. They had to wake him up. That's the that's the irony, right? Of the that's the the satire of uh, of the book of Jonah. Um, but where we do have a lot of seafaring, at least um, in the book of Acts, right? Acts of the Apostles, which again many of us we dedicated a year to study, especially when you get to the end there. To I think it's twenty seven. Um, where the the ship ship breaks apart on the on on uh, on on the rocks and and then uh, Paul says I told you so I told you we shouldn't go there it's uh, Paul's I told you so movement uh, moment um, so the, that's very much in, in I say that the New Testament New Testament text is relevant because it's closer much closer to the Talmudic text than it is to the biblical text okay so it would be interesting to go to 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 Mark and see what we might see there as well, how it relates to the text. What I'm trying to say is that very often a biblical text, especially a psalm, which is part of the liturgy, it, we don't know exactly what it's it, part of it is used in our. It's not one of the most famous ones in our liturgy, but it's used a little bit. Um, when a piece of liturgy is used, that's that's great fodder. That's great material for a sage uh, or, or someone who's giving a sermon give the sermon about yeah. okay especially um, this one part sounds very new testament to me and it says he start he makes the storm calm so that the way is there over still isn't there a story about he's about jesus um calming the sea yeah Making, and that's in right yeah that's in mark four, four if you yeah mm -hmm. I, yeah there we go great love it okay intertextuality intersectionality interreligiosity <laughs> we're just a whole intergroup of people we're inter okay all right richard are you still are you up yet are you are you, are you able to read or are you still you're still jet I can read okay. number three number three so we did one we did the first three of those for we did seafarers now we go on to those who walk in the desert i don't know how appropriate uh from where do we know about those who walk in the desert as it is written they wandered in the wilderness in, in a solitary way they found no city in which to dwell and then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way. They are grateful to God for his goodness. Okay, so this is not so personal. This is the national, right? This is the, the story of the people, uh, of the people themselves. And, and it really only talks about, it, it makes it sound like it's not talking about any of us walking through the desert. It makes it talk that it's 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 directly related to to the wanderings of the Israelites. Um, I'm getting a little feedback from somebody, and I don't know who. If if you could mute, unless you're speaking, okay. I sorry to do it that way, but oh, something something's in the background here. Okay, all right. I think we're better. Okay. Um, any comments or questions on this or 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 the previous one? Okay. Um, uh, Sister Claire, number four. Sure. Um, from where do we know about one who was ill and recovered? As it is written, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhors all manner of food, and they draw near unto the gates of death. And then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saves, saves them from their distress. And then... He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And it is written, they are grateful to God for his goodness. 
Okay. Nothing earth shattery, but we understand the idea. Um, again, somebody who's been in the hospital, for if we go to halakha lemaseh, practical halakha, um, people don't cross the sea too much anymore. And I don't know if they see it as dangerous as it used to be. Um, people who walk in the desert, yeah, if your car broke down and you're walking for 10 miles in, in the heat, whatever, but why would you be walking in the desert exactly unless it's already a, a dangerous situation? I think if you go backpacking, right, the trans, maybe somebody would say it, it, it but that's, it feels to me here, these are dangerous situations that you're not going to enjoy yourself. So if you went in, um, you know, uh, skydiving, and then you said the blessing afterwards, I would feel personally as a rabbi, I'd say, I don't know, you didn't need to do that. You know, if, if you didn't think it was, if you thought it was dangerous, you probably shouldn't have done it, right? Unless you needed to do it for some reason, for business, for save a life, whatever it is, okay. Um, but to put yourself in those situations, but people who are ill, look at that happens a lot. Uh, so very often, if somebody's had a heart attack or has had some sort of cancer treatment and 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 they've gotten a thumbs up from the doctor or some sort of a situation when they're in the hospital and they get out, very often people will say, "Will bench gomel," will say the blessing of hagomel, and this is the this is the original basis for it. Now, of course, you could ask, what if somebody has elective cosmetic surgery? Right? Is that the same thing? You know, that's uh, I, I see your, your your smiling sister, but that's a very real thing out in Palm Springs area. A lot of there's a lot of collective, a lot of uh, elective uh, uh, surgeries going on. Right. OK. All right. So. Um, let's go on unless there's anything. OK, uh, Eileen, does the does your mic work now? Eileen? Can you hear me? Yeah. Number five. Oh, great. Uh, section five, sure. top of the second page. I've got it. From where do we know about one who is incarcerated in prison? As it is written, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and scorned the counsel of the Most High. And it says, Therefore, he brought them down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. And it says, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. And it says, he brought them out of the darkness and of the shadow of death, and broke their shackles. And after God takes them out from that darkness and the shadow of death, it says, they are grateful to God for his goodness. Okay. Anybody notice anything about all four sections that are they different? Are they the same? What 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 might we say from a literary form point of view, from a ideological point of view, or a message point of view? Well, to ask the question first. What it's always a yeah fair. All right. So from a form point of view, how do we know this? Right. So. There's a pedagogy of the Talmudic sex for section. First, there's a, 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 a like a type. This is what you need to do. These four people kinds of situations need to give blessings. Okay. Then they say, yeah, but where do you know that from? So this is it's not this is not so much an it's not just an instruction in how to act as a Jew, how to behave as a Jew, but how do you know its connection? Where do you know it from? That that's what Talmud is, folks. Talmud is, where do you know it from? You know, you got to do it with your thumb like that. Yeah. Where do you know it from? Where are you getting this out from? And then often there will be, not in this case, but be, no, 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 we don't know from that verse. We know from that verse. We had that before in our second meeting. No, no, it's not that, that verse. Oh, wait a minute. So if you're going to use, if you're not, if you're not going to use that verse, what are you going to use that verse for? All right. So it's not only, is it, there's no verses that can't be used. They all have to be used. It's an intellectual, it's a huge, a multi generational, multi location. Um, intellectual exercise. And um, is it done for sport, for fun? Some of it is kind of, but it's culture. It's what we do. It's the, it, 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 this is what makes um, Jewish study, Jewish tradition, and, and being committed to Jewish study and tradition. This is what it means. When I was asked in rabbinical school, as they said, we had heard you said that, that the halacha doesn't, Jewish law doesn't 
fine. You're not bound by the halacha. And I was in a conservative movement rabbinical school. I said, no. I said, halacha binds, but halacha, what you're thinking of halacha is when one of the one of the older rabbis or rabbis from another from another historical period or what has made a decision, and that is the halacha. I don't accept that. Halacha is this what we've just done now. Halacha is the ongoing processing of how we behave as Jews and figure out why and from where do we know that and and if we don't have an authority, a scriptural authority, so then why do we do it? Do we base it on the story of another rabbi? Do we say, well, that was then and now is now? All that stuff is in the Talmud. Uh, do we say, oh, no, no, well, now we live amongst the Gentiles and we can no longer say those horrible uh, bigoted things towards Gentiles. No, So now we have, there's all this kind of stuff is in, in these hundreds of years. That's why the study is so important to me. Um, uh, Sister Claire, I may have told you before, but uh, when uh, Brother Alois, Brother Alois is the is the prior of the of the monastic community Teze, uh, right next door to where Claire lives, uh, and he um, tragically the former prior Brother Roger, blessed memory, um, uh, was was killed, and um, and he took over, and I had never met him before. I'd never I'd met Brother Roger a number of times, but I wasn't particularly close with him, and uh, I'm close with three or four guys, mostly uh, native English speakers. And um, and they and I came to do uh, uh, thirty days after Roger uh, passed away. We did a memorial service in his bedroom, in his room with a candle, and, and it was my way of, of of contributing to the community from a spiritual point of view. And at lunch, I was asked to sit down next to Brother Alois, and you start the lunch in a monastery quietly. Um, I think you also do, right? The sisters also eat quietly. No, not necessarily. No, no. Okay. Once or twice during the week, yeah, but yeah. Okay, so the, the brothers always eat quietly until you get to like the middle of the main course. And then the prior turns to somebody, this is what I've noticed over the 20 years I've been there, and says something, and then they all know they can talk. Nobody's yell yelling, nobody's shouting, but okay. So he turns to me, Brother Alois turns to me, and he says, tell me, Rabbi David, what is it that we Christians should learn from you Jewish people? And I'm thinking to myself, damn, I wish I had known the question beforehand. I would have done some homework or prepared some sort of very lofty, sage answer. What I told him, Claire, was this, and to all of you, I said, is that, is that in, in the Jewish tradition, we always try to educate, whether it's Hebrew language, whether it's Aramaic, educate our young people so that they have an unmitigated relationship with the text. That means not just with the biblical text, right, which was what Luther one of Luther's main things was, of course, that the people should have a relationship with the text and not just go through the priest. Um, it needs to, it, it, this engagement, I said, but for us, it's engagement. Uh, we want our children, ideally, even in the liberal forms of Judaism, we want our children to ideally to be conversant with the text themselves, because that is the texture of the Jewish tradition. Now, I'm not saying that's not the texture of the Christian or Buddhist or Muslim tradition, but he, he was asked what, the, I think that's what we could learn because the fact of the matter is there are not a lot of um, religious schools around the world in, in churches that are teaching children Latin. There are some, or teaching no. children Greek, Greek. which, would, no, be a, that's true. Right, which yeah. would be a great way to access the gospels, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sure. That, so that's, folks, that's why this text, which may not be so amazing, last week was, pretty amazing i have to say it was very entertaining right it was it was it was movie worthy right so this is kind of okay you get this and, and anyway so i think one thing is is the verses um some of the verses repeat themselves so something to learn from this this the way that's arranged we don't know that this was ever said in this format this is what has reached us after hundreds of years of editing and 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 polishing of the text passed down orally and then written down, and even after it's written down, it's it, it's massaged by the various people who who copied the manuscripts. And so this is how it appears. Some of the verses appear in multiple paragraphs. Nothing wrong with that. Um, one idea that I always think of when I see multiple verses is that there could have been one verse, but somebody else said, "Oh, wait a minute, I know another verse," and added it onto the manuscript or into the oral the oral traditions. Oh no, way, I, I know another one. That could also be the case as well. Um, okay, any other comments or questions or reflections? I was wondering, could it be like a kind of call and response that the Levites in the temple would say one part and then the congregate, the people, the Bay Knesset would say, Kila, Lom, Hasto, and they would say another so, part. Okay, so, 
Right, so that's how it could have been very much could have uh, could have been in practice in the temple with the song. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, were you suggesting perhaps in the study hall it went that way as well? Somebody said, mm -hmm. this is the law. Yeah, this, I, right. yeah it could the be. Rose, because no the Rosh Hashiva might have said one thing and then everyone else would re, would refrain, would do that because this re, there's a refrain in here that happens with several times and maybe they did the refrain. I like that. So it's like, wait, no, wait, call me, call me, me, me. I know, I know the answer. <laughs> yeah, they're all raising their hands, sure. A bunch of Jews that are Jewish men in a room raising their hands. That'll never happen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, shall we go on? Uh, Megan, would you like to read number six? So now we get to, okay, you've got to make a blessing. What's the blessing? What blessing does he recite? Rav Yehuda said, blessing, blessed is who bestows acts of loving kindness. Abai says, and he must offer thanks before 10 people as it is written. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Okay, so the first part is actual nusach, right? The actual formula, what is said. And here, this is where we got the idea of how benching goimel, or Levarech Gomel. Baruch, it would be the full. Baruch Ata Adunai, Yedoheinu Melech HaOlam, HaGomel Chasadim Tovim. And then there's a response to that. Here there is actually a response. So we're not doing that today. Uh, perhaps we, I think we've done it a few times, not so often, maybe a few times in our in our prayer um, online when somebody, but that's certainly an option to do. Usually one does it, um, Traditionally, men will do it uh, after having a, an aliyah, when they're called to the Torah, um, with a woman who's given birth in the Orthodox world. She either says it at the Brit, uh, when there's a minion of men in their world, 10 men, um, or in some cases would come to the synagogue as well to say it. Uh, a woman who needs wants, needs to say it would say it from the other side of the mechitza. In our world, of course, the woman would be called up to the Torah. And if there's not enough aliyot, then, the, you know, I, I've over the years always figured out creative ways to have somebody come up and say that blessing. Um, okay, that's the first part. The second part that is, okay, but you need a minion. Now, we didn't really think that beforehand, right? We thought in most cases, these are private things that are happening. In this case, you need to have a minyan. A minyan is 10 According to the older tradition, it's 10 men of age, that is age 13 onward. Um, and uh, according to last many decades in the, what is in the gender uh, equal egalitarian world, it is um, either any, any man or woman, uh, Jewish man or woman over 13, or in, sake of, in the case of girls over 12, depending on where you are in the Jewish world. Sometimes uh, 12 is thought to be the age, or in a place like Orami Bar, if we have 10 people, that's a minyan. For me, anybody who's come towards to our prayer and is participating, they're part of the minyan. It's not an official conservative movement response, far from it. And don't tell, don't tell me, folks, because I'll get in trouble. But uh, not really, I'm not going to be in trouble. I think people know that that's, that's the way I swing. But to me, that's important. Um, why 10? That's a whole other issue. I don't think our Talmud. There's a chapter in Brachot that deals with how they got to the number 10, but that's for another day. Okay. Comments or questions? All right. Uh, Sid, you want to read? We're uh, on paragraph seven. Parasutra said, two of them must be sages, as it is stated there, and praised him in the, in the, in the assembly of elders. Ravashi strongly objects to this, say that all of them must be sages. Objection? Is, it is, is it written in the, con in the congregation of elders? In the congregation of the people it is, is, is written, say that 10 are from the rest of the people, and in addition, there must be two sages. The question remains difficult. And what would that be in, in, in Aramaic? Sid, I think you know. All right, look, if you look at well, the end of the thing, it's, it's not a teku, it's a kasha. Kasha. 
Cassius uh, take that Cassius uh, be a bias. Uh, I forgot the one in the middle. Uh, a Cassius a, a question, fear Cassius questions, right? Cassius. Okay, questions answered will be answered by the uh, by by the uh, uh, the coming of the Messiah. Oh, that's right. that's no, the, also, uh -huh. also on Pesach you have the fear kashas. Right, right. So in this case, though, the kasha is is more from hard. It's difficult. In other words, when you ask a kasha, you're posing a difficulty. But this is a difficulty that remains. And sometimes that's the bottom line. So let's just, we'll get back to that in a second. So in comes Marzutra, much later a rabbi in this in this conversation, and says, well, by the way, it's not just to 10, you need to have two. Two of those 10 need to be a minion. And why two, two, say, uh, two of those 10 need to, in the minion need to be sages? And why do they need to be rabbi sages? Because it says, and praise him in the assembly of elders. Um, in, in Hebrew, bakal am. Mm -hmm. The assembly of elders. And now, why they got to Am, um, that, that has a lot yes. to do with the, the reason for Minyan being um, basically the 10 spies whose report was accepted by the Israelites, and then hence they got punished. One of the reasons for being punished to wander around the desert for 40 years, um, those 10 were called an Am um at some point. So that's where the rabbis and Talmud said, well, Am um must mean 10. In any case, so okay, so but um, in this case, that the, and that's why Rav Ashi says they must all be sages because it says um, and and the all of all ten is, n n must be, but um, but what what Marzutra is saying here is that only two need to be. Why two and not one? Because there's a plural involved, and two is the minimum of plural. It doesn't matter so much. But the bottom line here, and that's why this paragraph is so important for us, and in, in, again, in our trying to beginning to understand the methodology of the Talmud, there was a debate, an argument between Rav Ashi and Marzutra. And what do we do? What, what is the halakha according to the Talmud? What's the bottom line? There should there be no, 10. No, there is no Try bottom line. Opinion. No, they are, they are, in this particular debate, there is no bottom line. The Talmud says kasha. It's a debate. Stays up in the air. We don't have to solve all the problems. That's my point here. Okay, this one said this. This one said this. No. So today we would say, uh, or you often have in 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 Orthodox um, chuvot that is responsa, um, um, uh, and and if somebody does that way, yesh al mili smoch. He has upon whom he can depend. There is a view that says you're allowed to do it that way. That would be an Orthodox way of saying in 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 many cases. Uh, Orthodox people don't learn halacha directly from the Talmud. They, they, it has to go through the distillation process of of various uh, codifiers from for, uh, over over hundreds of years. But um, but it, very often in a responsa, it'll say there's a debate about doing it this way or that way. If you do it that way, you have who to depend on. If you do it that way, you can depend on. To me, this says this is the this is raising the debate as a value. One of our values is having a debate and leaving and agreeing to disagree. That's what I would say. It's an agreement to disagree. I think that's a great, I think that's an important thing here to me. It's a little thing and it's all over the Talmud, but this is the kind of the first time we've had it in our study together. Uh, this question. So if they agreed yeah. to disagree, why was everything decided in accordance with the law? Once again, slow, just slow, speak so a little they, bit slow. You said they agreed to disagree. So I'm wondering why the Talmud says that everything was decided in accordance with Hillel versus Shema. Okay, so so th that's not exactly what is said, right? There is a preference for Beit Hillel. There is a Klal. And, and, and that is an early stage of rabbinic. We're hundreds of years after that. So one of the early stages of the school's and the examples of debate, which are more most famous in the world of Jewish learning, are those of the schools of Hillel and the school of Shammai, who lived a little bit before Jesus, maybe even overlapped. Um, it, that's the pe time period. We're talking about early rabbinic period. And in those schools, there were a number of issues in which they had different opinions about. And there is a general rule. And by the way, there are all sorts of general rules in the Talmud 
that means that somebody, some person put that general rule there, right? There was no conclave. Mm -hmm. There was no, what do they call the, the, the guys that, that, that decided which were in the canon? Uh, you know, where they brought all the bishops together to decide. Council. Which, there's no council here. We, we're not a council religion. The rabbis, it wasn't a council in that way. Right, so nobody said, but there are, there is, there is that idea. You're right, Malka. That that well, we use, we go according to Beit Hillel, not according to Beit Shammai, which says that well, we don't agree, disagree. First of all, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the stage before that, where in mm -hmm. this Talmud there are many examples, so many examples, not in every, maybe every page, where we agree to disagree. That's number one. But even in the case of Hillel and Shammai, um, there's plenty of exceptions. Where, where Shammai's halacha was accepted instead of Hillel, and of course, there's always a reason why. But there's, there's, there, 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 they're not exceptions that prove the rule, as my teacher Zakovich used to say. They're exceptions that prove that there are exceptions. That's a, there's no, there's no general rule. There's a lot, a lot. There's more exceptions sometimes. I'm not saying there's more exceptions in this case. Um, the interesting thing with Shammai and Hillel is they were used as a, as an object. They're objectified to teach about coexistence on one hand. So coexistence, one example was, well, in the end, you have to decide what are we going to do in the synagogue? Are we going to stand up? Or are we going to sit down? Whatever the, the issue, we're we going to eat this, we're not going to eat this. Right? So somebody's got to decide. The decision was made, was, was, was left in most cases to the local authority. Now, what if there's more than one local authority? Okay, that's what this is about. This is, this is messy. This is a messy business. Nothing is clear cut about it. anybody who would come to you and say, and sometimes that happens in the Orthodox world, and very often people who are newly Orthodox will say, no, no, everything is very clear. I know exactly what I need to do. No, you, because you fell into a particular group of people that like to have that particular authority done that way, whether you're a Hasid or whether you're whatever, wherever you are. It can happen in, in as, as a reformer or a conservative Jew as well. You said, this is what conservative, what a reform Judaism do? No, we do a lot of different things. But for the Talmud, the Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai were, were props, if you will, to talk about coexistence in the community. One of the most beautiful passages is that, is that the two schools of thought disagreed about something really important, that the leveret marriage. In which cases does it apply, not apply, where a man must or can marry his sister-in-law when her husband died without children. We've had it in many cases. The Book of Ruth has this. Judah and Tamar in, in, in Genesis 38 has this. But it's, it's real life discussions in the Talmud. And, and, and there are diff very serious differences. Now, what, is, what does it mean? If you say that the brother can go ahead and do it in a particular case, in complex cases, can go ahead and take the wife of his deceased brother, and there's a doubt about it, well, if, if, if he's not doing the mitzvah, then he's doing a great avera. He's doing a great. He's trespassing on, on incest, the laws of incest, where you're not allowed to sleep with your sister-in-law. All right, stamka, just just that way. In other words, what they wanted to say is that there was this cardinal issue of issues of of incest and and marital law, in which they disagreed, and yet, and this is what the most important part, and yet they would marry their children to each other, and, and so. That's an interesting thing. That takes like a whole hour to do that particular section. It's a really important section because it shows at least in one part of the Talmud, trying to show we agree to disagree and we figure it out. We figure out how to do it together. Again, maybe it's just because you're here, Sister Claire, but for me, the community of Teze is when, when a, a group of men from all different kinds of Christian backgrounds, and then the young people that come to visit them every year, the thousands and thousands, they're coming with different ideas of what it is to be um, a, an observant Christian, a, a, a faithful Christian. And not only in practice, in the prayer itself, but also in the theology and, and the style of learning. And yet people come together and they make it work. They figure it out. To me, that's when, when I went there for the first time in 2001. That's why I said to myself, this is the greatest example of pluralistic education, pluralistic religious education that I've ever seen. And, uh, and, since, and it, what, since I've seen them since then. Okay, let's finish this up in the, in the minutes that we have to, uh, and then I'll take any questions or comments afterwards. Um, uh, uh, Megan, have you read today? I have read. Do you want me to read? Yeah, just go go ahead with this. <laughs> okay. Hard for me to keep track. 
uh, uh, eight. We're, in, we're number eight, yeah. Eight. Uh, Rav Yehuda fell sick and recovered. Rav Hana of Baghdad and the sages entered to visit him. They said to him, blessed is God who gave you to us and did not give you to the dust. And he said to them, you have exempted me from offering thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, you, do you get this? Does anybody get this? Yes, yeah, I think I have. Go ahead. But the, the, uh, the, the Revy came in and, and uh, uh, to visit and they, they gave the blessing, so then he didn't have to. Right. So, um, so th th this is an, an uh, uh, again, it feels like we're nitpicking, right? Why, why, don't you, we might say, don't you think the person should say the blessing themselves? Mm -hmm. So the question is, is that the point that you've got to say the words? Or is there perhaps another point here? Is, is that the words have to be said. The words need to be said. Doesn't have to be by you. To me, that's a really interesting idea here. We often think of the individual, the obligation of the individual. To you, aren't you ungrateful? No, you said it. It's out there in the world. It's out there in the air. It's a different way, I feel, a different way of looking at things. I, I love this breath, this blessing, by the way, right? Right? This is, mm -hmm. I mean, Bar, we should start saying this to whoever gets back from a dangerous hospital visit, you know? Uh, you know, th mm -hmm. thank God who, thank God, I'm not going to mention any names, I would thank God to X, who who we who saved you from the dust mm -hmm. right okay all right Donna, when someone have, says a prayer on your behalf you're exempt yeah there's that we're going to get into that right now that's that not in all cases but let's see mm -hmm. so again it's yeah, kind of like during the civil war rabbi when when if you were drafted you could pay somebody else to show up for you and then you were exempted <laughs> yeah that is kind of a uh, maybe an analogy, but Malka, we're, hang on to that question. We're going to get exactly to that issue right now. Donna, you want to read the number nine? No, I don't know. You're muted, so I don't know if you're telling us you don't have the text or if you're I, just... I'm unable to print anything. Okay, all right. So, uh, Rita, Claire, Rita Claire, are you with us? Number nine? Uh, still, still muted. There you okay, go. Okay, here I go. And didn't Abaye say that one must offer thanks before 10? There were 10. He did not need, as he answered to, he did not need to recite in himself as he answered Amen after their blessings. Okay, so see that somebody somebody raises the question, raises the right. Oh, wait, I have an anecdote. Also part of the format of Talmudic study. I have an anecdote. This and this happened, and he said, "No, I don't have to say it anymore." And somebody said, "Wow, weren't there supposed to be ten? So one answer would have been, "Well, not in this case, great right now." And said, "No, there were ten. That's just not in the story. There were ten. Then the other thing, and this is the key thing, Malka. What's the key issue here? He answered amen after their blessing. Right. Mm -hmm. so, that answer, so in answer to your question, Malka, if mm -hmm. any blessing that needs to be done, almost any blessing in practical halakha mm -hmm. today, right, is if you say amen to the blessing, you you don't you don't you don't say the blessing. You don't have to say the blessing. Oh, you can't. I mean, so if you carry a shema, if you just say amen, you don't have to say it. So, you're not so, you're exempt. No, Kriyat Shema, you do have to say, it's because it's not a blessing. So mm -hmm. the Amen works on blessings. And I, I for some, I think it's a little bit different, Kriyat Shema. I forgot the words, why why Chazal say you actually have to say them and actually hear mm -hmm. them. But um, but if we take Kriyat Shema for a second, saying Yishma, the blessing before Shema is um, Ohev Yisrael, Ohev Atamo Yisrael, or mm -hmm. Ohev Atamo Yisrael, Be'avad, all depends on what part of the Jewish world you're from. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and because you're not supposed to make a, a, any say any words between that blessing and Shema, what people will do in the synagogue, they will will say the blessing together with the shaliach tzibur, with the leader. Mm -hmm. If you do that, then you don't say amen. Right. You never, you're right. not supposed to say amen to your own blessing. By the way, a lot of uh, non-orthodox Jews will do that. You know, 
Hamotzi lechem in haaretz. Amen. And we all kind of do it. I, I fell into it with you guys. That's actually not the word. Amen is saying blessing on some, uh, saying, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, ticking off the button. What's the word? Ma'asher. Uh, what? Ma'asher. Ani ma'asher. Uh, approve or I um, agree. Checking agree. the box. It's like saying, I agree. I agree, right? You don't say mm -hmm. agree. You don't say some of yourself. I agree with what I just said. You don't. That doesn't make sense. Okay. That's the, so. That's the amen. That that's the amen part. Yeah. So um. So that's why Malka, um, we don't have to read the Megillah or the Torah reading ourselves. Mm -hmm. We hear somebody else read it, and we're yotze yidei chovatenu. We fulfill their obligation. Now there's an interesting question: Can somebody who himself who themselves is not obliged for what particular mitzvah can they? Um, you know, do it for somebody else. For instance, is a uh, deaf person who is who is um, exempt from from the reading of the Megillah. Can they do it for another time? But yes, you can. That and that's an important thing. That that's what a shaliach tzibur is. A shaliach tzibur um, is is somebody who is the leader of the prayer. Is um, sorry, the leader the leader of the prayer is is doing it on behalf of the rest of the people. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll get back to the, this issue in, in, in further times. But Rita Claire, just do us a favor and read the last part, please. Yes. Uh, Rav Hehuda said, three require protection, a sick person, a bridegroom, and a bride. It was taught in, a, how do you pronounce that? Baraita. 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 A sick person, a woman in childbirth, a bridegroom, and a bride. And some say even a mourner, and some say even Torah schol scholars at night. Okay, so what happened here is what we have, Rabbi Yehuda, we have an alternate tradition, right? We, the, the Gemara gave us the four that need that, that seems to be kind of the, the main section. And then somebody afterwards, whether it was a copier in hand or somebody verbally, orally at the, at the earlier stage, said, wait a minute, I know a different tradition. Rav Yudah says there's three, and there are three different different kinds of people, right? Um, um, now, is this is this an alternative or is this an additional? We don't know. But you can take it either way. Uh, a sick person, a bridegroom, and a bride. Um, sick person, we understand. Why would a bridegroom and a bride need protection? Anybody? I think it's because they're entering into a new world where it's it, things are unexpected and they don't know where they're headed and they need protection right so uh, yeah it, it, in a wide sense i would say yes absolutely but it, it's a little bit more specific here because it's it, it it means on the night of their wedding i think and why are they more why why are they more in danger than the guests or the parents and that has to do with liminality with liminal situations that is as you said they're moving into something new what what the anything which is giving birth is one of them yeah we know that there's medical issues when a woman gives birth there's there's dangers but bringing a new baby into the world that those those doorway situations it's, it's, we call them liminal right so those doorways those window situations um uh ar around death around birth around uh, uh, matrimony that's the time, and this is with the part which you're not going. What many people may not like to hear here. That's the time when you're most susceptible for demons. Demons do their worst work when people are in those liminal situations. And this is something which is um, human. Human civilization is like this. It's the same phenomena all around the world. But at those particular situations, uh, that's where you need more protection. Um, maybe we'll have issues of that coming up. I don't think we can go into it now. But, uh, and then, then there's the some say, and I love the some say, by the way, and oh yeah, I got another thing, I got another thing. Again, was that said in the Beit Midrash, in the study, oh, wait, I, teacher, I got one thing, I, I'm, you know, people looking for extra credit points, or is this just added on by a, a copy of a manuscript and a mourner, because a mourner is in a liminal state as well. And then the last part though, this is because Torah scholars, their, their special status is because People didn't like them and would be up on them in the forest. I don't know exactly what it is, but but uh, special treatment. And we're going to see a lot. There's a lot of chauvinism in the Talmud about, about the sages themselves. 
and those that were close to them. The final word I'll say about this is all this reflects, we don't know, it could be this much of the Jewish population, the land of Israel and of Babylonia compared to all the other Jews that were out there. We don't know. It, we, there's a false impression that everybody is received. I mean, because this is the main body of literature which has survived. And this is what was studied. So it gives us an optical illusion. We don't know the we don't know if the amount of studying over the last uh, let's say thousand years right now of the Babylonian Talmud reflects how important it was at the time it was being produced. That's a fascinating question, and there are people that write on that, but I'm certainly not qualified. Okay, any parting questions or comments? I was going to say to me, I look at this and I think, what an enormous responsibility we all have. In what way, Rita Claire? Well, uh, of course, where I center mostly is around um, a family. And I think uh, in, in childbirth, what an enormous responsibility to bring a child into the world and raise that child to be, um, uh, to be a, a, a decent person, someone to be proud of, and that could, that could, um, that could add to, to, to life. And then, you know, the, the bridegroom and the bride who, like I said, venture into a new relationship and they have to think of the other person more than themselves. Uh, I just think life gives us, we have a lot of responsibility living. <laughs> so what the yeah. Talmud is saying is that we have the responsibilities. Let's be mindful of those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. and, let's, and today's message was, let's give thanks when it works out. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Yes. All right, friends. Yes, anything else? Okay, then have a, a lovely weekend. Uh, we'll be gathering, even though we're on the road, we're having Kabbalah Shabbat and Shabbat morning. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.